So I'm going to share a little bit with you uh, about uh, some of the essential strategies that have led to our success, why we are so uh, excited about the work we've been doing with Vital Smarts over, over the last uh, 18 months, and, 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 and just about our efforts around character. So we have a, I think we have some slides that we can cue now. Uh, they start with a beautiful children, uh, some pictures of some beautiful kids. And so as we look for these beautiful kids, uh, I'll start with this question. How many folks uh, in this room have children? All right, so think back, and, and, and let's just try, how many folks have children who are under five? All right, cool, so like me, uh, we're sleep deprived. So let's think back, <laughs> so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take pause for one second. Is there any, uh, can we cue the slides? Would be great, please. Oh, it's me. <laughs> Talk about self-efficacy, I have failed to realize that the power was in my hands. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> and, and crucial conversations. Like, how many of you were sitting there going, he has the thing in his hand, <laughs> it's his fault, someone just tell him. See, there it is, right? Practicing what we preach. So we just had our first crucial conversation. So, so here are some beautiful uh, kindergarten kids, uh, also the age of five. And so what happens between these kids uh, entering kindergarten and 18 years later where less than 40% of them will step foot on a college campus, and less than one out of every 10 will graduate, what happens? And what happens to all of us that enables us to sit here today, whether we're excited, bored, happy, sad, whatever, what happens is, 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 is school. And one of the first lessons we learn in school is actually diametrically opposed to one of the key skills you need for life success. And so think back to your school experience and what happened? What is one of the first things you remember learning? Okay, you write your name. Someone else switch it up here, right? Raise your hand, obey your teacher, sit down and be quiet. <laughs> Somehow, we all got this message. And for those of us, like me, who that message was very difficult to embody, school turned out to be a really challenging place. And here was the statistics. Here are 10 beautiful Kip kids. And the tragedy is, as I said, only four of them will ever step foot, and only Evelyn will graduate. Yet we know it doesn't have to be this way. We know it doesn't have to be this way because we have already changed those odds. We've already quadrupled the college graduation rate for low-income kids in this country. We've already exceeded the national average for all demographic groups. So 87% of our kids qualify for the federal free and reduced lunch program. To give you a sense of what that means in New York City, to qualify for that program, a family of four in New York City would need to make about $27,000. So imagine that, living in New York City as a family of four on $27,000. Tragically, only 8% of kids growing up in low-income neighborhoods will graduate. So we've already more than quadrupled. We've actually just about five times the national average uh, for that and exceeded it. Our goal is 75% college graduation rate and 100% career preparation rate so that our kids can as Dr. Bandura talked, engage in self-efficacy at the highest possible way. And so to start, uh, these, video, these statistics we've already shared, I, I'd like to, 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 to start with this man, a giant in American history, an unknown giant by the looks of everyone in this room. <laughs> Yet we have all benefited from his life work, still unknown. 1917, his first name is Otto. Otto Frederick Rowetter. <laughs> Rings a bell. So Otto Frederick Ro Rowetter invented the bread slicing machine. So now you see where this is going, right? So when Otto Frederick Rowetter invented the bread slicing machine in 1917, mind you, however, it did not become widely known until 1930 when, now we all know this, who started manufacturing sliced bread? Wonder. So for 13 years, Otto labored in relative anonymity, clearly still hundreds of years later, <laughs> anonymity. But his ideas, 
transformed the way we ate. And no one thought anyone would ever eat sliced bread. Now think about how weird that sounds to us, that no one thought anyone would ever eat sliced bread, but we do. And so I'm going to share three things in the next 15 minutes about sliced bread that make Kip work. It is three ideas that we have to use, otherwise these ideas would be as unknown as Otto. So first is this work, and this is what has brought us to our partnership with Vital Smarts. Great leaders are the hallmark of great schools. Why? For one simple reason. They hire teachers. <laughs> they recruit, train, develop, and retain teachers. When you ask teachers why they go to a school, number one answer, the principal. Why do they stay at the school? Number one answer, the principal. If we want to transform classrooms in this country, what we have to do is get great teachers in every single classroom. In order to do that, we need great principals running every single school. The absolute key to KIPP's success over the last 19 years has been the remarkable teachers who teach our kids every single day. If you think about your own children, if you think about your own children, let's just try this experiment. How many of you remember the names of your child's teachers? Go ahead, raise your hand. A teacher, at least one. Now keep your hands up for a second. How many of you remember the name, keep your hands up for one second. How many of you remember the name of their principal? Right, right? Hands drop, because our experience at school, even as parents, is through the teacher. And so we realized that as our principals got better and better, so many of them were choosing to take other jobs within KIPP. They weren't leaving KIPP, but they felt that their job was to build great schools or lead great schools and then go off and train others and think about those type of activities. And we realized that just as they were reaching their peak performance, they were starting to think about other jobs. And we were saying, how could we encourage folks to be career and lifelong principals. And so fast forward 18 months, we met uh, David and Joseph, and we started talking about could we develop a partnership. And so this year, over the past year, we've developed these four vital behaviors through one of the most intellectually satisfying and rigorous experiences we've done in the last 19 years of KIPP. We brought together a working group from all of our schools, uh, from all of our regions, many of our schools. We interviewed 101 of our 109 current principals. We got stories from our former principals and we came up with these vital behaviors. And we will be sharing these out over the course of the next year about how they change our practice. And here they are. We fundamentally believe that these will have transformative impact for the kids in our schools. Sliced bread in the KIPP world. The last one I actually love, build-in time, <laughs> build-in physical recovery time and mental and emotional renewal. So here's the thing. When we started, we actually thought vital behavior number four could just be sleep more. And the debate around should we just have sleep more as the vital behavior was epic, and we ended up, ended up here. So I, I, I'm a fan of that one. So let's take a look at our second set of sliced bread. So our first set of sliced bread was principles are the key variable in school success because they attract, develop, and retain teachers. And then there were these four vital behaviors that we absolutely needed to focus on to maintain and improve principal performance. Second set of sliced bread is what do we do to dramatically alter what happens on college campuses. And here we learned five things. So we had four vital behaviors, and now we have five things about college completion. And here they are. Academic readiness and character strength. These first two are ultimately pre-K through 12's responsibility. But what's happened is there's been a total breakdown in, the, in, in, in school. Higher ed points their finger at you know, K-12. K-12 says we send kids off to college and none of them graduate. Middle schools point the finger at elementary schools. Elementary schools say we send you these beautiful babies. What happens to them in middle school? High schools don't talk to anyone else because they're high school teachers. It's really odd. So <laughs> academic readiness and character strength, essential part of what pre-K-12 needs to do. And then there are these three other factors. There's the right match. There's social and academic integration once kids are on campus. And then there's just making college affordable 
and sustainable. And we are actually looking at what are the vital behaviors in each of these various areas. This is a project we're just about to start. So when you get on a college campus, one of the key variables, this is like, we tell our kids, some professor on the college campus has to know you by name. So actually, if you connect with one adult on that college campus who knows you by name, your chances of graduating, based on our experiences, dramatically change. And so we're trying to figure out what are the vital behaviors that are going to remove the needle from where we are now with roughly 39% of our kids earning a college degree to 75% earning a college degree and 100% being prepared for career and life outcomes. So this is our second set of sliced bread. Our first set of sliced bread was what, by the way? Principal vital behaviors. Second set was around college completion. And the third set that I'd like to share, a sliced bread. So... <laughs> Brian would be like, smaller pieces of bread. <laughs> so, and stop showing bread. I'm like the counteraction to his presentation, right? You notice how he didn't show food and here's bread. Okay, so our third set of vital behaviors is this one. And I, I, I love this shirt because you, you, right down here, this is Gio's signature. This was designed by a high school freshman after being in KIPP for four years. And he designed a shirt, and at first, everyone was like, uh, something's wrong with the shirt, because they didn't realize that he actually drew them, A, in the correct mathematical proportions, right? 51% is just a little bit bigger than 49%, and B, after four years of KIPP, he was saying that character was more important than academics. And this was the shirt that was voted on by his 200 peers, as the founding shirt for the Kip High School. So imagine 200 kids in a contest, they chose this, recognizing that character is as important for life outcomes as academics. And I want you to think about it for a second, and I want you to think for our own kids. I'd love to hear some things. What do you hope for your own kids' outcomes in life? What do you want them to be? Successful, happy, I'm sorry, say it again? ethical. And what do you want them to learn in school? Same thing, right? So we don't all start thinking, I want my child to be able to do linear equations when they grow up, <laughs> right? We don't sit saying, I wonder if they can dissect the chicken they're going to cook for the family barbecue, right? That's not our way of thinking. We want them to have character. We want them to grow up to have fulfilled lives and meaningful lives. And from the beginning, we put character as important as academics. Over the last six years, we've been working with Marty Seligman at University of Pennsylvania, Chris Peterson from the University of Michigan, and Angela Duckworth at the University of Pennsylvania to sort of see what the research was around the character strengths that we had always been talking about. And so here was seven keys that we had developed over the first 15 years. If you want to make character as important, this is sliced bread to us. You go into a KIPP school, and this is what our people are going to talk to you about. They're going to talk, you got to believe that character matters. You got to model it. You got to name it. You got to find it. You got to feel it, integrate it, praise it, and track it. And this has got to happen every single day. It's got to be integrated into the DNA of a school. And so there's this James Baldwin quote, and it is, uh, it is the heart and soul of our work. Children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. And so if schools are going to say character is as important as academics, it has to be true for the adults as well as the children. And so this, this hit home for me in two really brief stories. Uh, I was yelling at an eighth grader, tragic experience. So it was embarrassing to stand up here on stage at a conference and say, I raised my voice at an eighth grader. Does anyone have children who are about that age? And you know, like, <laughs> it happens from time to time, right? Uh, and I'm like, oh, I could see. And, and, but I love the fact that the eighth grader turns to me and he goes, Mr. Ye Levin, you do know that you're yelling at me to stop yelling. <laughs> and I'm like, absolutely, stop yelling. But in that moment, I was like, wow. And then I, we did this. I was like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. And then secondly, uh, about the same time, I had this uh, Coke habit. And uh, I would drink four, three, four Cokes a day. Soda, soda, people. Soda. <laughs> relax, relax. I know I'm from New York, but it's soda. All right, here we go. So I would have like 
three or four Cokes a day. Uh, and I was trying to convince our students how they needed to take homework more seriously. Uh, and one kid came up to me and said, I'll do my homework if you stop drinking soda. I'm like, that's totally a fair trade. Little did I know how hard it was going to be to stop drinking soda, right? And so, but it was a shared journey. And from there, we realized that if character is going to be real in schools, it has to be a shared journey between parents, teachers, and students. It can't be something you talk to kids about, but don't share your own challenges. Adults don't have better character. In fact, the, the research on this is pretty clear. Character changes over the course of life. In fact, we know from where we started, kids, there's one character strength that is universally more present in kids than adults, which is? Well, honesty, I wasn't thinking about that. <laughs> we'll get to that later, maybe. But zest, enthusiasm, energy, right? Why? Because by the time we become adults, school has largely beat it out of us. So we started down this road, based on Seligman's research and Peterson's research, we started down the road of how we could breathe life into these character strengths in our school, three of which outpredict IQ for life outcomes, zest, grit, and self-control. And then from there, we started thinking about the elephant. And so elephants, anyone know how elephants, you know the whole thing, elephants have a great memory and all this weird stuff. Anyone know how elephants remember stuff? Smell and muscle memory. Large animals remember, because their muscles are so, they, they're so big, they have to remember through muscle memory, repeated actions. And so here's a homework assignment for everyone tonight. And uh, apologies for intruding on your personal lives. How many people in this room, when they shower, we're going to assume in the next 24 hours, let's start with this. How many people in this room are nighttime showers? How many people are morning showers? Okay, interesting, interesting. So if you live in New York City, you are highly likely to be a nighttime shower because by all the grime, you're like, okay, let me. So now when you take a shower next, here's what I'd like you to try to do. How many of you start by washing your body? People are either body washers or face washers first. So how many of you start by washing your bodies? Okay, all right. How many of you start by washing your faces? All right, others start by washing their hair, evidently, okay? <laughs> you can tell, I only wash, well, we'll get in my hair separately. Um, so here's what I'd like you to do tonight. Whatever you start with, I'd like you to change. I'd like you to change the order that you bathe yourselves. And you will have this universal experience. You will end up washing yourself twice because you will lose track. Did I clean this part? Am I clean? What's going on? And you'll end up going right back to the way you started. And so what we did is we are trying to make the engagement of character muscle memory. And we have these strengths, which are regrettably a little cut off, but we'll go through them pretty quick. And we've called it a character growth card, and there's seven strengths. Zest is the first of them. And we are actually trying to encourage folks to be zesty. And to engage in these activities. And then we have a character growth card where parents, teachers, and kids talk about this once or twice a year along with their academic performance. So Zest is one of the seven. And, 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 and anyone who's really interested, I'm not going to talk through all these, the uh, actual behaviors that go with them, but if you're really interested, it's on our website. You could email me, dlevin at kip.org. It's like a, an obsession of ours. So Zest is one. Grit. Love this. Love talking with parents about tries hard even after experiencing failure. It's just like a, such a meaty conversation. Another famous uh, social science experiment, Walter Michel's Don't Eat the Marshmallow, thus the symbol for self-control of the marshmallow. No, okay. So from the beginning, work hard, be nice was always uh, our motto. And it turned out in working with Angela, who is emerging as one of the sort of leading experts on self-control, uh, it turns out that their self-control can be looked at as two domains, work-related self-control, which is like work hard, and then interpersonal self-control, which is basically like be nice. So we had zest, grit, we had self-control, we had optimism or hope, gratitude dovetails nicely with saying thank you, social intelligence, and finally curiosity. And for us, these are the muscle memory, the third piece of sliced bread for our schools. And hopefully, they will become like wonder. We will be able to speak of these things as if they are as natural as wonder bread, 
as opposed to Otto Frederick Rowetter, who we started with. And in speaking of these three things, the first of which was principal vital behaviors, the second of which was college completion factors, and the third of which was character. Hopefully, Evelyn will no longer be one of ten, but ten of ten. Thank you guys very much, and it is deeply grateful to the Vital Smart people. Thank you. Thank you.